morning. Please, please take your seats and uh, welcome to a very special Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, this is uh, our, an annual event now. Uh, the uh, the Weiner visiting professorship, Gary and Marie Weiner, who are with us today. Um, uh, I became acquainted with. Uh, gee, it's got to be six years, seven years ago, close to now, and uh, and they have become. Uh, uh, great believers in UW Health and great believers in this department and the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine and they have endowed a visiting professorship that allows us to bring in a, a, an international figure annually for uh, a two-day visiting professorship giving grand rounds for cardiovascular medicine on Thursday and then uh, interacting with the faculty all day Thursday and then grand rounds today uh, for the Department of Medicine. This year's uh, Weiner visiting professor is Dr. Francois Aboud. Dr. Aboud uh, took his uh, medical degree in, in Cairo, Egypt, before coming to Wisconsin and uh, the United States where he undertook his residency training at Milwaukee County Hospital. He then undertook a research fellowship with the American Heart Association at Marquette and then an advanced research fellowship at uh, the University of Iowa College of Medicine uh, beginning in 1960, and he's been there ever since. Um, he rose through the ranks as an assistant professor for four years, uh, an associate professor for three years, so after seven years he became a full professor, two years later became chief of cardiology, and six years later still became chair of the Department of Medicine in 1976, where he held that role uh, until 2002. Um, but since then, he's continued on as director of the Cardiovascular Research Center at the College of Medicine. He continues as the Edith King Pearson uh, Chair of Cardiovascular Research and Professor of Internal Medicine, uh, as well as Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Iowa. The Cardiovascular Research Center that he's developed uh, is truly interdisciplinary involving 15 departments, three of the four colleges, 75 tenured faculty members, and over its first 41 years garnered $408 million in direct and indirect funding coming to the University of Iowa. Um, he has uh, close to 300 publications, the last one published I believe this week, and uh, 50 books and book chapters. Um, and he's been funded by the NIH for almost 60 years. Um, he's been very much involved. I, the, his CV is condensed here from 90 to two pages, um, but uh, he's been involved nationally and internationally, especially with the NIH, with NASA, uh, uh, with the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the American Board of Internal Medicine, where he was a member of the Board of Governors. He's uh, been on multiple editorial boards. My first ever paper was sent to Circulation Research and we were very terrified to send it to, to the imposing Dr. Francois Aboud at the time, but he was kind to us and actually published one of my early papers in uh, uh, the uh, journal Circulation Research. Among the many, many awards he's received, he's been elected to the ASCI and was elected to and then president of the Association of American Physicians. He was president of the American Heart Association. An endowed professorship was uh, created in his honor that the chair of medicine at the University of Iowa will hold in perpetuity. And he's received the Distinguished Scientist Award from the American Heart Association in 2007. He's given many, many lectures nationally and internationally and we were very fortunate to uh, to be able to recruit him for this lecture, lectureship. On a personal um, perspective, I've gotten to know Dr. Abud over the years. We're, we're in a number of different organizations together and I know if I go to the gym at six in the morning, I find Dr. Abud there. He's always there before I am and he's going faster on the treadmill than I am. Um, and I think that's a testament to his endurance and the fact that really for 60 years he's been a leader in cardiovascular medicine. Today it's really my privilege to introduce him as he provides grand rounds for us entitled The Power of Your Autonomic Nervous System and the Neuro 
immune synapse. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Dr. Francois Lou. Thank you. Goodness, this is, um, Clint told me to speak loud and affirmatively, so I am. Thank you, Rick. You're wonderful. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And uh, I'm going to try to tell you a story that I think has been exciting. And we've been doing some experiments along those lines for quite some time. Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that your autonomic nervous system is very powerful. But its power is not just to allow you to address hemodynamic stresses but it regulates cardiovascular diseases in the pathologic process in a very significant way through its effect on the immune system. Now that's, that's the message, and, and uh, let me just share with you, here we go, the two parts of this presentation. The first one will be the demonstration of the power of the autonomic system, and the second part will be the regulation of the neuroimmune system. The story can start with the Nobel Prize to Cornel Hymans, who identified, excuse me, who identified the carotid sinus nerve as a major regulator of the respiration, but it also is a major regulator of cardiovascular responses and hemodynamic responses. It took about 32 years before another Nobel Prize was awarded to Katz, Von Euler, and Axelrod for discovering the neurohumoral transmitters acetylcholine and norepinephrine and the mechanisms of their storage, their release, and their inactivation. And it took another 30 years to the present time of 40 years until we now are able to activate these sensory nerves to regulate the autonomic drive in a beneficial way, hopefully. Now, a demonstration of the, the power of your autonomic system can be demonstrated here to the tune of Handel's Messiah in this short video. Clint, I'm going to try to, I'm going to need you. I thought I did. Oh, I don't need you. <laughs> the Son Here we go. and the Holy Spirit. Now and always in the air. So here is what your autonomic system can do to you. Maybe about 70% of the time. And it is a very dramatic control of your total power. It's more than just a drop in a field of practice. It can unlock no matter where you are, who you are, you don't remove it. Suddenly, you look for more control. But this usually happens after a period of stress or some time. And it doesn't stare at you. And, 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 okay? So this is my own. Uh, I mean, the reason why you laugh is because you don't get to all of these things and you just lie. But it just tells you to close the question and the loss of the sympathetic nerve activity significantly high before a sudden loss of sympathetic activity associated with bradycardia and hypotension and a vasodilatation in the finger recorded with plethysmography. So the sudden loss of sympathetic activity and the dramatic activation of vagal tone contribute to this. Now, if I were to ask you, your chief resident, yeah, 
I have to ask you, what causes that reflex? What, what receptors can you think about? Yes, you might be able to think of the barrel receptors, maybe. But this is not a barrel receptor reflex because the pressure is dropping during the bradycardia. The barrel receptor reflex is activated when your pressure goes up and you inhibit sympathetic activity and activate the parasympathetic. So, but this is happening when blood pressure is dropping. So whenever blood pressure drops and it's associated with bradycardia, it's because of another reflex. So as I said, the barrel receptor reflex is activated when your pressure rises and you get inhibition of sympathetic activity in bradycardia. But there are other receptors that can be activated and still cause this inhibition that I described, but they are originating in the heart, in the left ventricle and the atria. They're cardiopulmonary receptors and the vagal afferents are the major mediators of that sympathetic inhibition of bradycardia. So that, that's the first message, that you have inhibitors besides the barrier receptor. These are the cardiac receptors that are inhibitors. Now, that's an acute response. And what we are interested in, have been interested in, is the autonomic regulation of the pathologic process in cardiovascular disease. So the notion that the autonomic system is essential for acute circulatory adjustments may be all right, but the new concept that we're proposing here is that the autonomic system, by virtue of the regulation of the immune system, can induce a significant pathologic press or can be protected. Now, I always refer to this study in humans, uh, reporting the plasma norepinephrine levels in patients in heart failure, and if the plasma norepinephrine level in these patients is over 800 picogram per milliliter, the survival drops within you know, a couple of years. But if the level is between 400 and 800, the survival can be extended to five. And if the level is even below 400, they only, you, know, you get a significant survival of 60%. This is a very powerful, very simple clinical demonstration of the correlation between norepinephrine levels, which reflect predominantly sympathetic activity and mortality. Now, uh, the, the demonstration of the excessive sympathetic drive in heart failure has been then and now. Ferguson was one of my chief residents in Lidebach, who was, was a first year cardiology fellow. When these measurements were made, these are the best measurements in patients in heart failure, showing that as the progression of heart failure severity increases, the sympathetic drive continues to increase here as cardiac index drops from three to two to one, excessive sympathetic activity. And the increase in sympathetic activity is correlated with the increase in left ventricular field pressure and in, in age-matched control. So this, this demonstration very early on of the increased sympathetic activity was very dramatic. And this is chronic. And another situation where that happened, slide I showed yesterday, in obstructive sleep apnea. Now here is a measurement, the first measurement ever, of sympathetic nerve activity in patients asleep with obstructive sleep apnea. Look at the oscillation in sympathetic drive in, in arterial pressure. The pressure can rise during these periods of apnea up to 200 millimeter mercury. Now think of a patient sleeping for about six or seven or eight hours having this happen hundreds of times during sleep the dramatic pulse pressure and arterial pressure increases and sympathetic activity increases can affect the progress of cardiovascular disease. But the dramatic demonstration here is how do you inhibit that sympathetic activity? We would like to know how we can suppress that sympathetic activity. We need to know the sensory signal that can do it. But here is a dramatic demonstration that this patient once that patient takes one breath, 
the dramatic suppression of sympathetic activity is very impressive. And that oscillation that happens during sleep over years results in sustained exaggeration of sympathetic activity during the awake state. And treatment with positive airway pressure CPAP over months can reduce the sympathetic activity and the risk of cardiovascular death. So this is a demonstration uh, in, in patients of the, the excessive sympathetic drive and, and what it can possibly do. The, the thinking that maybe we can reduce sympathetic activity chronically by electrically stimulating the carotid sinus nerve or stimulating the vagus nerve was always considered but abandoned because of the thinking, the premise that you can't really electrically stimulate the carotid sinus nerve and sustain an inhibition over time. The observations implied or suggested that you can get a transient effect suppressing sympathetic drive when you stimulate the carotid sinus nerve, but sustained stimulation of the carotid sinus nerve was never believed to really sustain an inhibition for a long time until Lohmeyer decided to test that in dogs, and he did the first carotid sinus nerve stimulation and he found out that over a period of about one week, he could indeed uh, sustain the, the inhibition and the bradycardia. With that observation, experiments were done then in animal models of heart failure. And I'm showing you to the left here a model of heart failure with pacing in, in dogs. So pacing induced heart failure is associated with dramatic increase in plasma norepinephrine and increase in a dramatic drop in survival over a couple of months. Or, but when you stimulate the carotid sinus in these dogs, you suppress the norepinephrine levels and you double survival. On the right is another experiment in, by a Japanese colleague is very dramatic in another model. The model here is myocardial infarction in the rat. And again, the mortality is dramatic, but when Sunagawa simulated the vagus nerve for about 40 days and stopped the stimulation, look at the survival of these rats after myocardial infarction and the survival was associated with vagal nerve stimulation earlier. It stopped right here, but then that period of stimulation impacted significantly on survival and correlated with the drop in norepinephrine level. So with the, the, these two powerful examples of how suppression of sympathetic drive and activation of the parasympathetic can increase survival, one would then begin to consider the possibility that this opposite effect, if you have an increased sympathetic activity, you should try to suppress it. If you don't have an increase in parasympathetic and you lose it, you want to activate it. And the question, can it happen in humans? And then it would last 10 years or so. There have been several experiments done in humans. Here I'm just simply portraying for you the electrical stimulation of the vagi, which has been done by neurologists in, to treat epilepsy for many years, and how it can be used in patients in heart failure. And to the right here, I'm showing carotid sinus nerve stimulation in humans with increasing voltage of the stimulus. You get greater increases in arterial pressure in a bradycardia. So it can be done in, in humans. It has been tried and it continuing to be tried in humans in heart failure. So that's the demonstration of the autonomic control and its importance in survival in heart failure and myocardial infarction. So how does the autonomic system do that? That chronic protective effect or chronic pro-inflammatory effect. So here we talk about a fatal conspiracy between the immune system and cardiovascular disease. So this, in this triangle, 
the apex here shows that autonomic dysregulation can increase mortality. In B, mortality in cardiovascular disease is often ascribed to a significant inflammatory response in a variety of cardiovascular diseases. And what I'm be talking about is the interaction between the autonomic system and the immune response that is a powerful, makes the autonomic system a powerful regulator of the immune response and therefore a powerful determinant of survival. So, most cardiovascular diseases, you're aware that atherosclerosis and the plaque is composed of pulp cells, T cells, dendritic cells in heart failure, you have cytokine storms uh, induced by central activation of microglia in heart failure, atrial fibrillation, the atria are infiltrated with monocytes and cause fibrosis and remodeling that causes atrial fibrillation. In stroke, the release of this antioxidant from ischemic, uh, the cytoplasm of ischemic neuron can activate the release of cytokines from macrophages and it cause really uh, the inflammatory response that induces hemorrhagic stroke. And in hypertension, both the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system are activated, and that's where I'm going to focus some of the, the, the research that I want to share with you. So the knowledge that the immune system is important in hypertension goes back 40 years. I mean, it has been known that uh, docosol hypertension can happen in control uh, mice, but in the experimentally nude mice without thalamus, docosol cannot sustain hypertension. For docosol to cause hypertension, the thalamus is needed 40 years ago. Now we go, back, uh, go forward, a, a more compelling experiment in the spontaneously hypertensive rat, I'm going to talk to you a lot about that model because it's a model of genetic hypertension. And uh, that, that model, uh, the animal increases its blood pressure about the six week or so of life before that they're normal tested. And the pressure continues to increase. If you transplant the newborn SHR with thymic extracts, you inhibit the progress or the development progress of genetic hypertension as if, as if that transplant regulated the expression of T lymphocytes that, that can be protected, some of the protective T lymphocytes. Now, fast forward another 30, 40 years, there is this experiment that shows the importance of the immune system in angiotensin models of heart failure. Angiotensin models of hypertension and then heart failure, but hypertension are very commonly used models. So here is the model we're talking about. A two-week or three-week infusion of a dose of angiotensin can cause the red line here increase in arterial pressure. That's the angiotensin hypertension model. Now, if that experiment is done in RAG knockout mice, the RAG knockout doesn't make T lymphocytes and doesn't make B lymphocytes. And so when Harrison and his group, now Vanderbilt, did this experiment in the RAG knockout mice, there was this, the hypertension was dramatically suppressed. But then when they adoptively transferred B lymphocytes, the response was still abrogated. When they transferred T lymphocytes, the, re the hypertensive response was restored, and the T lymphocytes were shown to invade the vasculature. And so what, what he showed us here is that the inflammatory response induced by angiotensin is uh, through the T lymphocyte and is dependent on T lymphocytes. Again, the dependence of hypertension on the T lymphocyte. Now, another approach would be 
to identify the interleukins that can be released with the cytokine stimulation. And IL-6 was an important cytokine, and the deletion of IL-6 seemed to abrogate the hypertensive response to angiotensin. And the first thing you might think of is maybe IL-6 is important for the vasoconstrictor response of angiotensin. And so these, these uh, scientists found that the afferent renal arteriole in the IL-6 knockout still constricts with angiotensin. So why is the hypertension abrogated in here? Then the, the, the finding was that the IL-6 mediates another type of activation, the, the, the kinase jack and the, and, and the, the, the transcription factors are phosphorylated by IL-6. When you remove IL-6 induction with angiotensin, you can't phosphorylate uh, these mediators and the hypertension is abrogated because the phosphorylation of these kinases and transcription factor causes sodium retention. So it's a different effect of angiotensin being influenced by IL-6, and that's the sodium retention and the aldosterone effect in the kidney. So demonstration, again, that the immune system that is driven by angiotensin is very determinant of the hypertension that develops. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of the powerful examples of how sympathetic activity can enhance the immune response. And in this experiment, angiotensin was given centrally. And the central angiotensin is probably the most prominent effect of the pressure response to angiotensin. You can think of angiotensin having vascular effect or renal effect, but eventually the long-term effect of angiotensin is by increasing the central sympathetic drive. That's why you can still treat the hypertension by blocking the sympathetic drive. So here, the central angiotensin given to these animals increased over a period of 60 minutes, the sympathetic activity going to the spleen, major immunologic organ, and to the kidney. And the central angiotensin caused significant increase in expression of inflammatory gene. These gray bars are induced by angiotensin, increased expression IL-1 beta, IL-2, IL-6, IL-16, TGF beta. But see what happens when the splenic nerves are cut. An angiotensin response, the inflammatory expression is significantly abrogated while the renal nerve activity is still sustained, indicating that the, the anti-inflammatory influence of denervation of the spleen was very important. So sympathetic activity to the spleen is very inflammatory and can contribute to the inflammatory response and you can suppress that despite the fact that your renal nerve activity continues to be increased. That, that makes you think about you know, how does renal denervation works if, if really it works. And then that's, that's another question. Now, another demonstration of the importance of sympathetic nerve activity is what this group of investigators identified when you produce cardiac ischemia in pain, anxiety, or heart failure the central drive of the sympathetic nerve activity is exaggerated. Now, the sympathetic regulation of your bone marrow induces the release of progenitor cells in monocytes to go to the spleen and go through an increased extramedullary monocyte poiesis, and those monocytes will migrate to the plaque and induce plaque rupture. So sympathetic drive initiated by stresses that involve ischemia can induce an inflammatory response that 
that migrates, the, uh, causes the migration of these monocytes to induce plaque rupture. A, a greater detailed demonstration uh, by the Narendorf group indicates that it's the beta-3 receptor in those niches of, uh, of bone marrow that induce uh, the monocyte mobilization and the, uh, the, uh, 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 the inflammatory cells that uh, migrate to the spleen and then induce that uh, plaque damage and plaque rupture. Basically, essentially, the beta receptor again, adrenergic regulation of the niches inducing that uh, hematopoietic stem cell migration, a trans epithelial migration. So we're talking now about trans epithelial migration of these T lymphocytes. And a very interesting study that was done by the Sharman group that emphasizes the, the circadian oscillation of sympathetic nerve activity has an influence on adhesion molecules and thereby regulate the trans migration of these uh, the, the inflammatory cells from the capillaries in skeletal muscle to induce an exaggerated inflammatory response to injury in the periphery. And the migration of bone marrow cells into the marrow in the the animal models in which a bone marrow recruitment, the hematopoietic stem cell recruitment in these animals were, uh, that were irradiated and subjected to a bone marrow transfer. The bone marrow transfer was most successful in the dark in these rodents when sympathetic activity was high. And these authors postulated that if bone marrow transfer in human were to be accomplished with a joint sympathetic drive like isoproterin oil infusion, for example, the, the bone marrow effectiveness of bone marrow recruitment will be greater. So it makes us think about uh, maybe if you want to increase bone marrow engraftment, which they try to do, you can do it if at the same time you activate the sympathetic system. And I thought this was a, a very powerful demonstration of a beneficial engraftment, bone marrow engraftment, versus a, a, another uh, effect in the periphery where the inflammatory response in skeletal muscle also influenced by transepithelial uh, endothelial migration can take place. Now that's enough of uh, the message I want to give you about the exaggerated effect of sympathetic activation. Now I want to report to you some very impressive studies that show that parasympathetic activation can be effectively very protective. And so these are NF-kappa B reporter mice that have been subjected to bilateral subdiaphragmatic vagotomy four weeks earlier. And you see the NF-kappa B expression and luminescence is dramatically increased in those mice with bilateral vagotomy. That means that the, your, your, your vagal influence uh, is suppressing an inflammatory response and vigotomy, unmasked, if you will, that, that tonic protective effect. Now, in these animals, after the four weeks of vigotomy, if the uh, splenocytes, the T cells, are taken out of the spleen and activated with activator of, uh, uh, of T cell receptors, the release of the inflammatory mediators from these T cells that have been deprived of the parasympathetic restrictive suppressive influence are markedly 
exaggerated. So this is a dramatic demonstration of the constitutive effect of your parasympathetic system in suppressing the inflammatory NF-kappa B, the major mediator of inflammatory responses, in the gut and the colon, where you have a huge reservoir of immune cells. Another very dramatic demonstration of the effect of parasympathetic and vagal activation that can be protective is this classical experiment of Kevin Tracy that was published now, now uh, more than 15 years ago. But you may know that if you give LPS, you activate toll receptor 4 and you get septic shock. This is arterial pressure in these mice that have received LPS. Now, what prevents that septic shock is the stimulation of the vagus nerves. And Kevin Tracy demonstrated a significant reduction in serum TNF and liver TNF when the, the vagus nerves are stimulated. And he proposed what he calls an inflammatory reflex, a, a protective inflammatory reflex, whereby, say, the LPS will centrally activate the efferent vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve supplying your reticular endothelial system, your liver, your spleen, and the, the macrophages in your gut. And those macrophages have cholinergic receptor on them. Now, we think of the macrophage as uh, the, the, the productor of uh, cytokines when you activate toll receptors in it. But very importantly, what was shown in here is that those monocytes macrophages have cholinergic receptors. They also have beta receptors. They also have angiotensin receptors. And so when you activate these other receptors, you suppress or enhance the cytokine response. And that's the crosstalk at the level. And it, this response has been recognized as a, an anti-inflammatory cholinergic response. Now, an extension of that same study is to try and see if that, that nicotinic protective receptor that was activated with vagal stimulation, which receptor it is. Now, nicotinic receptors are a confusing mess that as far as I'm concerned, and there's so many of them. But the, the, the demonstration uh, by Kevin Tracy of a specific subunit that has been confirmed of the nicotinic receptor, an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor, can be deleted in the knockout of alpha-7 nicotinic receptor in mice removes an anti-inflammatory contribution. So these are... Uh, the cytokine responses, IL-6, IL-1 beta, TNF-alpha, hypertrophy of the heart, and glomerulosclerosis in the model of two kidney, one clip hypertension. This two kidney, one clip hypertension in its well-established model, but the, what we're seeing in here, and in the absence of alpha-7 cholinergic receptor, the inflammatory the responses in that model and the damage to the glomerulus in that model are enhanced. It's just a quick picture of what happens to the heart, control the damaged heart, to the kidney, control damaged heart, when two kidney, one clip hypertension is induced in the absence of this nicotinic receptor. Okay, so I've shown you two examples of how sympathetic drive can increase the inflammatory response. I showed you a couple of examples how your parasympathetic tone uh, can suppress the inflammatory response. How is that relevant to hypertension in a model of existing hypertension? So here we ask the question, is there an intrinsic abnormality in the innate immune cells of hypertensive patient or hypertensive animal model. So that now you propose that 
in a model of genetic hypertension, the animals are born with an abnormally pro-inflammatory immune system, as if the, the inheritance of a pro-inflammatory immune system is a major component of the cardiovascular disease. So is there such an intrinsic abnormality that we can identify in innate immune cells from WKY, these are the normotensive controls of the spontaneously hypertensive uh, rat. And then the next question is, does angiotensin or the cholinergic neurotransmitter nicotine, does it alter the immunologic response of these immune cells from the normotensive control versus the SHR? So, here is the scheme that we're proposing. You have a neurohumeral drive. You can activate the sympathetic angiotensin uh, arm or the parasympathetic, which is protective here, inflammatory here. The innervation of the bone marrow and the innervation of the spleen can enhance the inflammatory response or the proliferation of inflammatory immune cells. We, in the innate immune system, which is the, the initiator of the inflammatory response with the activation of Tor receptor ligand, and, and that activation can be regulated by how the cholinergic or adrenergic or angiotensinergic receptors are regulating that inflammatory response. And the usual response would be cytokine release from the innate cells activating the T lymphocyte. And both the T lymphocytes and the innate cell can evade the brain, your arteries, your heart, and your kidney, and induce NF kappa B and induce an inflammatory immune cell migration in the pathologic state. So what do we do then? We go and pick up that animal model right at birth and begin to explore their innate cells. And the hypothesis would be that if you activate those cells with the TLR ligands, and I'll tell you more about those, you release cytokine. But if at the same time, the nicotinic or angiotensinergic receptors are activated, there is a modulation of that TLR pathway in either a pro-inflammatory or an anti-inflammatory response, and then you get your T lymphocytes that are recruited and uh, recruited into vascular tissue or renal tissue and cause hypertension. So that's the model. The bigger picture then would be that you have your immune system. It has an innate component and an adaptive component. The adaptive component is the T lymphocyte. The innate component consists of the macrophages, monocytes, dendritic cells. And these adaptive innate immune cells with their toll receptors, there are 10 or 12 toll receptors, and each one of these toll receptors is targeted by a specific exogenous ligand or endogenous ligand. The exogenous ligand can be like LPS uh, or double-stranded RNAs containing DNAs, and endogenous ligand, like annexins, nuclear line, and heat shock protein. The exogenous and endogenous ligand can activate the Tor receptors, and as I said, there are several Tor receptors with specific ligand to target them, induce the, in, uh, the inflammatory response that results in overexpression of NF-kappa B, which then regulates the expression of various cytokine, and the monocyte can release the cytokine to cause the cellular damage. The same monocyte has 81 receptor or cholinergic receptor. The alpha-7 cholinergic will suppress the inflammation, and the 81 receptor or adrenergic receptor also will enhance the inflammation. So that's that's the premise. So how do we test that in the, the SHR bo uh, born uh, with early normal tension and after four or five or six weeks they develop hypertension. So we, we take the spleens of the 
normal tensive rat and the spontaneously hypertensive rat, before they develop hypertension, that's between the age of three and six weeks, we, we isolate the splenocytes and we add to them TLR ligands, either double-stranded DNA or, or uh, double-stranded RNA or DNA fragments, and activate the inflammatory response and collect the release of cytokines. Or in another group, we treat those uh, splenocytes with nicotine or with angiotensin II, and then activate the TLR ligand and see what happens to the cytokine. Now, you, what you, would you protect? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, well, I, I don't want to show you the result. Uh, the, the prediction would be that adding nicotine or angiotensin will modify the magnitude of cytokine release. And, and here is what we find. Now, what I have here, bear with me here. These are different ligands in a dose-related fashion exposed to activation in a dose-response relationship. Now, these TLR7 and TLR9 are activated by DNA or double-stranded RNA. These are the two ligands that we're going to focus on. They're the ligands that cause a significant increase in IL-6 and IL-10 and TNF-alpha. But we didn't find any difference between the response of the splenocyte from that genetically hypertensive animal compared to the normal tensive WKY. We said, you know, hell. Uh, but what we did find, though, is that the activation of the nicotinic receptor prior to exposing those splenocytes to the ligands that activate TLR7 and TLR9. The activation of the nicotine receptor suppressed dramatically the inflammatory response. Whereas in the SHR, when we added nicotine, the total receptor response was markedly enhanced. So nicotine unmasked pro-inflammatory response in this neonatal splenocytes. They inherited an abnormality in their immune response to the tall ligand that is pro-inflammatory in SHR. With angiotensin, angiotensin had no effect in the WKY normal tensin, but in the SHR, those splenocytes exposed to angiotensin and then activated by the, T the TLR activation caused a dramatic increase in the cytokine IL-6. So this was the first demonstration that a genetically hypertensive animal has is born with an immune cell population that was pro-inflammatory, particularly unmasked when you activate the autonomic receptor with nicotine alpha-7 receptor here being intact, being anti-inflammatory, whereas uh, the nicotinic receptor in the SHR was pro-inflammatory. So the nicotinic receptor in those splenocytes of the genetic hypertensive rats before even they develop hypertension are pro-inflammatory. And the same thing happens with angiotensin being pro-inflammatory. Now, is that relevant to humans? And so I thought I'll just sneak in in here the data that have been described in monocytes from hypertensive patients where IL-1 beta secretion by the peripheral monocyte from hypertensive patient show a significant increase in IL-1 beta with angiotensin. And that increase is blocked by uh, the uh, uh, angiotensin receptor blockade. So in patients, the immune cell population is pro-inflammatory 
in the activation of interleukin-1 beta is enhanced by angiotensin. It contributes then to the pathologic state. Uh, here, uh, LPS induces also an, an excitatory pro-inflammatory response in those splenocytes. And the L1 beta secretion uh, became extremely relevant recently with that study by Paul Ritker that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They gave canakinone map, the, the monoclonal antibody to IL-1 beta to patient, 10,000 patients over a period of several months and years. They found out that its monoclonal antibody, specifically of IL-1 beta, reduced dramatically the incidence of recurring myocardial infarction in patients. So I'm showing you here uh, the monocytes from hypertensive patients, and I'm referring to that study that was recently published two or three weeks ago, indicating that monoclonal inhibition of IL-1 beta was dramatically influencing over months of treatment the progress of cardiovascular risk and reduced dramatic. So uh, I'm just going to go a bit faster here. The demonstration of the, the pro-inflammatory potential of these splenocytes or uh, was shown also, we showed that in a wake state in the animals. Before that, I had shown you the isolated splenocyte, but here in the awake animal, uh, the angiotensin in, uh, or nicotinic response is significantly increased. But then we wanted to know what, what, what are these inflammatory cells like? What are they? So here is the, the profile of hypertension in the spontaneously hypertensive rat. And we, by self-sorting, we try to identify the different cell population in the spleens. And we find that a, a population of cells that had a marker CD161, which is a pro-inflammatory marker that has been identified in humans percentage of the CD161 cells in the spontaneously hypertensive rat at the first day of birth was significantly higher than the normal tensive and progressively increased. So we identified a CD161 marker of an inflammatory cell population at birth and increasing with age. And so we wanted to study that population of that CD161 marker and it's present in human, and it's a pro-inflammatory marker, and the T lymphocytes that have the CD161 marker can proliferate with nicotine. So not only is nicotine induce, inducing the inflammation, but it can proliferate those cells. And those cells infiltrate. I'm showing here that they're inf infiltrating the, the spleen, they originate in the spleen, and there is a, an, an expression of CD161 in a large percentage of the SHR at four weeks of age and at 42 weeks of age. But the other marker of T lymphocytes, CD4 and CD8, are not different. So this marker is particularly significant. It invades. Uh, the spleen, it also evades the aorta in SHR. Again, here the per percent of cells that have CD161 at four weeks and 42 weeks, and the CD4 and CD8 are not altered. So there is something about the expression of this pro-inflammatory marker that is CD61. And uh, basically here I'm portraying that the CD1 expression is, can involve many different cells, including T lymphocytes, but the major uh, regulation is involves, besides the T lymphocytes, the innate immune system. Now we want to know further what 
distinguishes those CD161 cells. And what we're saying in here, that the activation of those innate cells is associated with the overexpression of a master regulator of the immune system demonstrated in other models of autoimmune diseases. And we find in here that this retinoic acid orphan nuclear receptor is overexpressing that CD161, and eventually the T cells become programmed to release IL-17. The TH17 cell in the IL-17 is becoming a major marker of inflammatory damage in endothelial cells and a major regulator of the vascular damage and hypertension. And so here I'm trying to show you the gene expression of this raw gamma T in the SHR is significantly high, and the expression in the splenocyte of IL-17, A and F, RNA, NT and F alpha are all increased. And uh, here in the aorta, the CD161, IL-17, A and F are increased in the aorta, uh, and to some extent, TNF RNA. So the gene expression of these inflammatory cytokines and the programming of the TH17 particularly is dramatically enhanced in these uh, inflammatory cells. All right? So what are you going to do, Frank? So you have a CD161. You have raw gamma T expression. Even when you suppress raw gamma T, we were able to show a drop in the arterial pressure. So what's the next experiment? What in the next experiment you would want to do, Chief? <laughs> so here's what we, we did. We read the literature. Did I read it? Oh, we read the literature. We found out that way in 1987, somebody cross-fostered the SHR pup with a WKY mother. And the cross-fostering of the SHR pup resulted in a significant reduction just before the weaning period. That exposure was sufficient to decrease the pressure of that SHR pup. Now, the opposite didn't happen. If you take a WKY pup, and cross foster by an SHR mother. You don't get hypertension. But this was enough for us to consider our next experiment. And so we thought we're going to cross foster the SHR pup and see what happens. What happens to the CD161 cell? So you say, well, cross foster with the WKY mother, CD161 cell should not increase. Well, hell, it did increase. Cross foster didn't help. Now, we're waiting six weeks. We're going to continue to wait up to 30 weeks to see if CD161 are affected by that period of cross fossil. That, that's one approach. What's the next thing you might want to try to do? Anybody? I want to <laughs> change the population of immune cells. So the next thing to do is do bone marrow transfer. So you take these pups, you irradiate them, you kill their bone marrow, and then you transfer adoptive transfer of bone marrow from the normal tensive to the hypertensive and see what happens to the hypertension once you give them a new bone marrow from the WKY. But it, we couldn't do that simply without really creating a, a, a hybrid because of the, uh, the, the immune the matching of the immune system in the two. So we create a hybrid WKY and SHR, we irradiate the marrow, and then we transfer bone marrow, bone marrow transfer either from a WKY marrow or an SHR marrow, and watch what happened to the blood pressure. Now, we, when we transfer to the F1, the WKY marrow, CD161 cells that are now adopted and have been engrafted, in the, edge, in the WKY marrow, the CD161 cells don't go up. But here, 
when we transferred an SHR marrow, the transfer uh, was included a high percentage of CD161 cells. We said, okay, uh, the grafting happened, it's successful, you could ab we were able to express CD161, then we expect hypertension to happen. And again, this is the SHR pressure, the WQI pressure, and here are the transfers. Blood pressure was the same. And what would you do? Uh, you might say, I give up. The experiment failed, the bone marrow transfer didn't work. But we didn't give up. Sometimes a negative uh, experiment can, can reveal something very interesting. And of course here, there's no exception. That's why I'm showing it to you. So what we found out that there is a significant enhancement of periodic adipose tissue in the, the engrafted marrow from SHR. And we then must have transferred in that marrow a pro-inflammatory process that enhanced the adventitial changes in the aorta. The periodic adipose tissue is a very powerful generator of cytokines. And, and so found that we were excited, but that made, it made us begin to think about what is hypertension? Is it just an elevated pressure? Is it a hell of a lot more? Is hypertrophy in the heart and hypertension necessarily common processes that are going together? Now here we are identifying a bone marrow transmitted property that increases the aortic inflammation and maybe even aortic aneurysm. So part of the hypertension disease state includes a vascular inflammatory process in a cardiac hypertrophy. So that's the summary. I told you about the, the, the sympathetic drive, the pro-inflammatory, parasympathetic being anti, the effect on both innate immune cells and the adaptive immunity, the cytokine release and the migration to the tissues that causes the, the damage. And the summary is your autonomic nervous system is powerful modulator of the immune system, the pro-inflammatory morbid consequence. The vagus nerve provided a protective anti-inflammatory effect in that appears to be mediated by alpha-7 cholinergic receptor. In the genetic model of hypertension, the anti-inflammatory effect of nicotine on innate immune cells is reversed to a pro-inflammatory response in the genetic hypertension prior even to the onset. And then an excessively large population of the CD161 positive spinocyte, which is present in humans, is present in SHR in the neonatal state before they develop hypertension and increases with age. That then brings me to the conclusion that the innate immune system in genetic hypertension, which to a large extent our hypertension, is abnormally regulated by the autonomic system to trigger pro-inflammatory responses to all sorts of endogenous antigen. These induce a pathologic renal vascular damage that initiate and sustain the hypertensive state. And uh, the, the, these are the people who have helped. Chaplot has been with me about three decades. Sal and Madhu are PhDs in immunology who recruited to my lab and taught me everything I know. And, uh, and I'm now beginning to teach them something that they don't know. The immunologists at our have helped tremendously add some credibility to what our work is, and we collaborated with Dave Harrison at Vanderbilt and Howard Jacob in Milwaukee, and we're grateful for our cell sorting facility, and I'm grateful to you for being patient and listening to us today. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Abood. I wish we had time to take questions. Where I'll have, if people want to come to the front of the room, I'm sure Dr. Abood would be happy to answer any questions. I do want to thank you so much for visiting with us and present you with this plaque signed by myself and Dr. Hamden 
in appreciation of your serving as the Weiner Visiting Professor. Thank you. Thank you.